again, we're going to go through each one of these. And if you write it down exactly the same way that I write it down, it gives you a good grounding base to study from. When we're talking about probability, remember probability is a value that ranges between zero and one whole. And it has these likelihood statements, right? The impossible, unlikely, equally likely, likely, or certain that go along with a specific type of probability. Only three of these, impossible, equally likely, and certain, have exact values. Only three of them have the exact values. So let's start with impossible. Who can remind us? Impossible means it has to equal exactly what? Zero. It has to equal exactly zero or zero percent. That's important to remember. So I'm writing these off to the side again. Write what I write today so that you have something to study from, Michael. Make sure you write what I write. Okay? Then we've got unlikely. Unlikely is not an exact value. It is a range of values. It is between two values. Unlikely is going to be between zero and 0 0.5 or zero and one half or you could say zero percent and 50 percent. Unlikely is not zero. Unlikely is not 0 0.5. It's not one half. It's not 50 percent. It's between those values. So 0 0.00000001 is an unlikely value. Just the same as 0 0.4999999 forever and ever and ever is also an unlikely event because it's between these values. That's unlikely. So you've got a range of numbers that it could represent. Then you've got equally likely. Equally likely has exactly one value. What does equally likely have to be? Angel. Very good. It has to be equal to one half or 0 0.5 or 50%. Okay. These are all the same. They're just different ways of writing it. One half is the same thing as 50%. 0. 0.5 is the same thing as 50%. These are just different ways to write one value. That's equally likely. Okay, then you've got likely. Likely, again, is another one of those range values. It's between, it's gonna fall between that one half and one whole or 0 0.5 and one whole, or 50% and 100%. Anything between those two values represents your likely value. Anything in between 50% and 100% means it's a likely situation. Anything between 0.5 and one whole is a likely situation. Then you've got the last value, certain. Certain means it equals exactly one whole or 100%. When you get a probability that is exactly one or exactly 100%, that's a certain event. I am certain that tomorrow is Friday. It is impossible that tomorrow is Tuesday. Okay, these are things that I know are definite or not definite. Okay, so now let's take a look at these numbers. 0 0.29, 0 0.29, what type of likelihood is 0.29? Unlikely. Right? It falls between 0 and 
that is unlikely. Two thirds, two thirds. I had some kids last period say that they thought it was unlikely only because they didn't know what two thirds was. So what can we do when we don't know what a fraction represents? What can we change it into? Amir? A decimal. You guys have an easier time comparing decimals than you do fractions. So let's convert it into a decimal. And again, as a reminder, when we are converting into a decimal, you just type your fraction in, and then we hit what magic button? The two arrows at the bottom. That's our little magic button that we press. When we hit that and enter, there's our decimal. It's 0.6 repeated. So that's 0 0.666. It keeps going on, right? What kind of likelihood is that? Likely. This is a likely probability. Okay, 48%. What is that? Go ahead, guys. Unlikely. 48%. Remember, if it's equally likely, it has to be exactly 50%. 48% is not 50%. Impossible, equally likely, and certain have to be exact values. They can't be close. They have to be exact. So this is less than 50%. This is unlikely. What about 0.5? Equally likely. Right? It's 0.5. That's an exact value. It is equally likely. What about one whole? Certain. It's exactly one whole. And certain is exactly one or 100%. What about 0.74? Likely. Very good. It's greater than 0.5, but less than one whole. What about zero? Impossible. And then again, here's another fraction that if we don't know what it looks like, we can just convert it. When we convert 1 over 8, it comes out to 0 0.125. 0 0.125 is what kind of probability? Unlikely, right? It's less than 0.5. Think about it, 0.1 is less than 0.5. So that's an unlikely probability. So you're going to have, I think it's two questions that are going to be identifying likelihood using those likelihood relationships. Okay, let's go on to problem number nine. Go on to problem number nine. If you spin this eight section spinner, eight sections means it's got eight triangles here. If we spin it 400 times, I'm gonna give you these three statements. We wanna identify which statements are true and which statements are false about this spinner spinning it 400 times. So first, let's go ahead and identify the sections. I've got yellows, reds, and blues. How many red sections do we have? Four. So I'm going to go ahead and so that way you guys can see it easily. I'm going to go ahead and highlight those four sections in red. I also have yellow. How many yellows do I have? Three. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight those three sections in my yellow. So that way it's easier for you guys to see from the board. And then I have one section left that's blue, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and get that one colored blue, just so again, so it's easier for you to see. All right, so there are my sections. And you make this line darker so you can tell that this is split up. The first statement says that you will land on blue about 50 times. Notice the word about. In fact, two statements talk about and one statement says exact. I want you to write the following down. With probability, this is very important. When you're using probability and making any kind of predictions, probability and predictions are always 
an about value. They are never an exact. So anytime you see a prediction being made and they said it's going to happen exactly this much, you know that that's wrong. Because we've done it before. We've done it through a computer simulation rolling the die. We've done it physically rolling the die in class. We know that even though the probability of landing on a two is one out of six times, if I roll this die six times, am I going to land on two exactly once? No, I might, but it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed to happen that way. So probability and predictions are never an exact amount. That's important to know. They're always going to be an about, an approximation. So now with problem A, it says it's about 50 times. We need to see, okay, is that number accurate? So in order to work this out, we are going to set up a proportion. You guys have done those proportions often. We're going to identify the probability of blue. What's the probability that blue is going to happen? Not just one, one out of eight. Probability of blue is one blue section out of eight total sections. So we have one over eight for the probability. We want to know how much, so X, out of what? Out of 400. See, right here, 400 times. We want to go ahead and spin it 400 times. So we want to know out of those 400, roughly how much can we expect to be a blue? Once we have it set up, we can then do our cross product. We're going to multiply 8 times X to get 8X. We're going to multiply 1 times 400 to get 400. Then from there, we simplify by just dividing both sides by 8. And that's going to give us X equaling 50. Is that what they said? Yes. They said 50 and they said about. There's our keyword. They used about, which is a proper form for probability, and then they gave us the correct number, 50. So is this true or false? True. This statement is true. Okay, let's look at statement B. True or false? You will land on red exactly 200 times. Right off the bat, I can say it's false. Why can I say it's false without doing any math? Because it says exactly. Remember, the term exactly... It is never, it is never going to be exactly. So even though 200 is a correct number, the fact that they used exactly makes this a false statement. The fact that they use the term exactly makes that a false statement. Okay, let's take a look at problem C. They use the term about. They use the term about. So they're good so far. Now we got to check to see if the number is correct. So they want to know yellow. They think that about 150 times it's going to land on yellow. So we're just going to follow the same setup that we did here. Except is it going to be 1 over 8? No. What is it going to be? Why? Why is it 3 over 8? Because there's three yellows out of eight sections. So we're going to do three over eight is equal to X over 400. It's still out of 400 spins. Now we do our cross product. We're going to go eight times X, which is eight X. We're going to do three times 400, which is 1200. What's our last step again, guys? Divide by what? Eight. Good. So we're going to divide both sides by eight, and we will get 150. So is that the correct number? Yes. 
and they used the term about. So is this true or false? Mm -hmm. True. Okay. Timmy, zoom in. Is that better? Yeah? Okay. All right. Katie. Katie wants her experimental probability of flipping a coin to be as close as possible to her theoretical probability. What should she do? Should she flip it a hundred times, a thousand times, or ten thousand times? Ten thousand. Why? What did we say? You always want what? The larger number of trials. You always want the larger number of trials. So let's go ahead and circle answer choice C. And then that leads us right in to our next question. It's an open response question. It asks us, if you want your experimental to be similar, which is the same thing as close, to your theoretical, what should you do? you should perform it a large number of trials. So go ahead and put a box around this portion. Experimental probability to be similar to theoretical probability. When we want this to happen, the only way that it's ever going to happen is when you keep performing the experiment over and over and over again. Two times is not enough. 20 times is not enough. 2 million times, that's when you're getting better. So you want a large number of trials. And remember, trials means how many times you flip a coin or how many times you roll a die or how many times you spin a spinner. It's you performing that action. The more times you perform the action, the better the result's going to be. So just think of it again. The more you study, the better your grade. The more you practice, the better your skill. The more that you perform the experiment, the better the result will be for your probability. Are there any questions so far? Pretty simple stuff, right? Okay, let's take a look at problem 12. Problem 12, you're gonna roll a die and you're gonna flip a coin. You're rolling the die and you're flipping the coin. So that's compound probability. That means there's two activities happening at the same time. So what do we do when we're finding two activities at the same time? What do we do with those two probabilities? Multiply them. Good, so we're gonna break these apart. We're gonna find the probability that a number less than four is going to be landed on. Which numbers on a number cube are less than four? Three, two, and one. There you go. So the numbers three, number two, and a number one. So how many numbers is that? Three out of six. So the probability that you're going to get a number that is less than four is going to be three out of six. All right, then we're going to do the same thing here. Heads. We want the probability that a coin is going to land on heads. What is the probability that a coin will land on heads? One out of two, one half, right? One out of two. And like Denham said, what do we do with the two probabilities? We multiply them. We're going to multiply those two probabilities together. 3 over 6 times 1 over 2 is going to equal 1 fourth. Okay, let's do the same thing again here. This time we want a number greater than 2. We want a number greater than 2. What numbers are greater than 2? 3, 4, 5, 6. How many numbers is that? four numbers. So that means the probability is going to be four out of six. Getting the probability of greater than two is going to be four 
out of 6. All right, probability that it's going to land on tails. The probability that it's going to land on tails is 1 half. Right? Tails has got the same probability as heads. Then we just multiply them. When we multiply, what do we get? One third. All right. Questions 13 through 16 is going to use this table. We want to take a bag of marbles. I know that says bad. It's supposed to say bag. Sorry. A student's going to pull a marble out of the bag, record the color, put the marble back in, and then do this all over again. And they made this table based off of the results. They got red, blue, green, purple, purple, red, purple, green, red, red, purple, blue, green, purple, red, red, blue, purple, green, blue. Okay? So that's the listing of all the times that they pull the colors out. Based off of this table, so this is an experiment, Based off of that experiment, I want the probability of red being pulled out. So what do we need to do? Count what? Count how many reds? Let's count how many reds. So here we go. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six reds. Okay, so I'm going to say, all right, the probability of red is equal to six. Is that right? No, no, why not? I have six reds. What else do I need to know? How many total? I need to know how many total because remember it's supposed to be out of a fraction. So it's six out of what? 20, right? If we count up all the boxes, it's out of 20. So we have 6 over 20. I need to simplify that. So when I type 6 over 20 in my calculator, it simplifies to 3 over 10. So there's my answer. Do I see it here? No. We've got 3 sevenths. We've got 0 0.3. We've got 34%. We've got 0 0.48. 3 tenths is not one of the answer choices. What should I do? Change it to a decimal. Very good. So when you don't see your fraction answer, convert it to a decimal. And how do we convert to a decimal again? With a double arrow button. We're going to type that double arrow button in our calculator. And what is it going to be as a decimal? 0 0.3. Do I see that answer? Yes. There is my answer right here. If you don't see your answer as a fraction, but they happen to have decimal or percentages, then convert it. Convert it to a decimal, see if it's there. Okay, let's do the same thing for blue. Count up how many blue there are. How many blue are there, guys? Four. There's four blue. We've got one right here. There's number two, number three, number four. We've got four blues out of how much again? Out of 20. So the probability of blue is going to be four out of 20. That simplifies to what? One fifth. Is one fifth an answer? Yes. All right. Here is the answer. One fifth. So we're good to go. All right. Let's do it for green. How many greens are there? Four. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, four greens. So it's the same idea, right? Probability of green is four out of 20, which we already know simplifies to one fifth. Is one fifth an answer choice here? No. no. So that means, okay, we know we gotta convert it. So we're gonna convert it to a decimal by using that double arrow button, and what is the decimal? 0 0.2. Is 0 0.2 an answer? No. 0 0.2 is not an answer. So now we need to go ahead and convert it to a percent. How do we convert to a percent? Multiply by 100. Convert to a percent 
by multiplying by 100. You convert to a percent by multiplying by 100. So we're going to do 0 0.2, and we're going to multiply it by 100, and that gives us 20%. Is 20% an answer? Yes. 20% is an answer. Okay. Number 16, we want the purple. How many purple were there? Six. Right, if we go all the way back up and look, we've got six purples. One, two, three, four, five, six purples. Six purples. So we already know that the probability of six over 20 can simplify to three over 10. Is three over 10 an answer choice? Yeah. Okay. So like I said before, if you don't see your answer as a fraction, then you need to convert it to a decimal. If you still don't see your answer, then multiply it by 100 to change it to a percent. If you still don't see your answer, what does that mean? You did it wrong. Try it again. Don't just guess. Try it again. Okay? All right. Let's go on to the next page. Oh, were you still copying? No? Okay. All right. Tree diagrams. You are not going to have to construct a tree diagram, but you are going to have to, to select the correct tree diagram that has been constructed. Does that make sense? You are not going to be building it yourself, but they're going to give you a series of tree diagrams. You have to indicate which one's the correct one. Sometimes that can be more difficult. So my advice always for problems like these is ignore the answers, make it yourself on your scrap paper, and then see which one aligns to what you made. Okay, so for here, we're going to make a tree diagram that represents the different ways that Julie, Craig, and David can come in first, second, and third place. So can Julie be in first and in second place? No. Once somebody is chosen for first place, they're no longer able to be chosen again. They can't be second and they can't be third. Okay, so that means what you have is a dependent situation that once somebody is chosen, they are removed from the picture. It changes the likelihood that they can be chosen again. So, Let's set this up. We have to start off with first place. When I'm choosing a first place winner or somebody who's going to be in the first position in my, my line, how many people do I have to choose from? Three, right? I have Julie. Julie can be chosen. Or I could choose Craig or David. Okay, then I have to go to second place. For second place, how many people can be chosen for second place? There's two people remaining, right? So if I chose Julie for first place, who's still left to choose from? Craig and David. But maybe I didn't choose Julie for first. Maybe... Maybe I chose Craig. So if I chose Craig for first, who's still left for second? Julie and David. But what if I chose David for first? Who's left? Julie and Craig. Am I done? Why not? You got to have third place, right? You've got to show who's left for third place, don't you? Okay. So if I extend this line here, who's left? David, right? By extending my line here, that says, hey, I chose Julie for first, and I followed it up and chose Craig for second, which means all that's left is David for third. What about here? If I extend this line, who's still remaining? Craig. That means that if I chose Julie first, 
and David second, all that's left is Craig for third. Finish this line. What's this one going to be? David, right? I chose Craig. Then I chose Julie. That means David is remaining. What about for here? Julie. I chose Craig. Chose Craig. Then I chose David. So that means all that's left is Julie. What about right here? Craig. Okay, that means I chose David. Then I branched out, chose Julie. The only one left remaining is for Craig to be chosen. And what's my last branch? Julie. That means I chose David for first, Craig for second, Julie for third. That's your construction. Let's do another example together. Making a tree diagram that shows the different ways that you can arrange the letters max, M-A-X, without reusing any of the previous letters. The fact that it's saying that you cannot reuse then that means once the letter is chosen, it's no longer available. So it follows the same setup. Okay, when we first choose a letter, how many letters do we have to choose from? When I'm choosing my first letter, how many letters are there? Three, right? M, A, X. I can choose M, I could choose A, I could choose X. Once I chose M, how many letters are left? Two, what are they? A and X. If I chose A, what's left? M and X. If I chose X, what's left? M and A. Am I done? No, because I still can choose a third letter, right? This says I chose M and then I chose A, which means what's still remaining? X. This says I chose M and then I chose X. What's still remaining? A. What about for here? What's still remaining? X, right? I chose A, then I chose M. I still have X remaining. What about for here? M. I chose A, then I chose X. M is still remaining. I chose X, then I chose M. A is remaining. I chose X, I chose A. M is remaining. Put a star next to this one. This example is the closest example that you're going to have to what's on the test. Rearranging three letters without reusing the letters. If you can understand number 18, then you'll be fine for the test. I want you to try number 19 on your own. It's the same concept, except instead of letters, it's colors. You've got blue, pink, and green, and you're painting a rainbow. And again, you are not going to use the same color twice. There's no reusing previous colors. So make a tree diagram, and you can say B, P, and G. So almost like you're rearranging letters again. Try number 19 on your own. All right. Tell me what my first uh, section is going to look like. B, P, G. Good. Blue, pink, green. What goes here? P, G. What goes here? B and G. Good. And what goes here? B, P. All right. Tell me here. G here, P next, G next, good, next, pink, and then last one, G, not G, 
B, <laughs> blue. Okay. All right. So this should be the setup here. All right. Let's take a look at the next question. Problem number 20. Kyle has two cookies. He's got oatmeal and he's got sugar. He's got three cakes. He's got vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. This is not one of those you can't reuse, you can't uh, do it again. This is a different kind than here. This is not an ordering one. This is, I'm going to choose a cookie, and from there, I'm going to choose a cake. These are combinations instead. So it's different than putting them on order. This one's a, I'm choosing combinations that can be created. So here, all it wants to know is what the sample space is. So they're not even going to give you a tree diagram. They're literally going to give you this scenario, and then they're going to give you four different sample spaces, and you've got to choose which one's the correct sample space. So my advice to you on your scratch paper, you should be creating the tree diagram and then creating your sample space and see which one matches up. It's quick and easy to build a tree diagram. What are my co cookie choices? Oatmeal and sugar, so big O, big S. Then I've got cake choices. So how many branches are gonna come off of there? Three. I've got three cake choices. I've got vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Same thing for here. Vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. So when I wanna write out my sample space, how many uh, outcomes should I have in my sample space? Six, right? I've got oatmeal cookies with vanilla cake. I can have oatmeal cookies with chocolate cake. I could have an oatmeal cookie with strawberry cake. I could have a sugar cookie with a vanilla cake. I can have a sugar cookie with a chocolate cake. Or I can have a sugar cookie with a strawberry cake. So once I've created my diagram and written out my sample space, then I'm going to look at the answer choices. And I'm going to go, all right, there's the one that matches what I have. Don't look at the answers ahead of time because sometimes, I mean, you're going to have three wrong answers staring at you. That can get confusing. Create it yourself without looking at the answers and then compare, okay? Go ahead and do number 21 on your own. All right, who can tell me how many outcomes are gonna be in the sample space here? Nine, All right? There's gonna be nine outcomes in this sample space. When I create this, I've got chicken, I've got steak, and I've got shrimp as my choice for entree. And then from each entree, I have three choices for a side. I could do soup, I could do salad, or I could do fruit for all three of my entrees. So once I piece that together, I'm gonna be able to create a sample space that has nine different possible outcomes in them. I should have chosen better ones that had all different letters so I didn't have to write those out. But again, I've got chicken that can go with soup. I've got chicken that could go with salad. Or I have chicken that could go with fruit. Those are three options. Options four, five, and six all have steak. So you could have steak with soup, you could have steak with salad, or you could have steak with fruit. And then options seven, eight, and nine are about the shrimp. You could have shrimp with soup. You could have shrimp with a salad. You could have shrimp with fruit. Okay, so that's creating the sample space. All right, let's take a look at the next page, page uh, or the last page, question number 22 and question 23. 
they're going to give you a tree diagram. All you have to do is say how many outcomes would be in your sample space. And that's really easy, especially since they gave you the tree diagram. All you have to do is kind of count it. If you take a look here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six options. Then counting down here, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 total possible outcomes for a sample space. And then it's also easy enough that if you didn't want to focus on the tree diagram, you could focus on the fact that a coin has how many outcomes? Two. And a die has how many outcomes? Six. And what would we do? Multiply to get 12 total. So you could either count the last column. So when you're looking at those last parts of your tree diagram, count how many are in that last part. That gives us 12. Or you could do what we did with the fundamental counting principle, multiplying them. Okay, let's take a look at problem number 23. For problem 23, it's the same thing. You've got a three section spinner that's got red, green, and blue. See, red, green, blue. And then you've got a coin that has heads or tails. So how many different possible outcomes are there? Six. If you counted, you could go, okay, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four, here's five, here's six. There are six outcomes. Or you could do fundamental counting principle. The spinner has three outcomes. The coin has two outcomes. And you just have to multiply to get six for the total. Pretty simple stuff for there. We're almost done, okay? Let's take a look at the last two questions. Problem 24, you've got a bag of marbles that's got 65 blue, 90 red, and 115 green. I want the probability that we're gonna draw out a blue marble, that we're gonna draw out a blue marble. What's what the first thing I probably should do? Add them all, right? We want to know what the total is. The first thing that we should probably do is find out that total by adding all the marbles. So take 65 and add 90 and then add 115. And what is our total? 270. So that way, when I'm writing my probability, I know what my probability is out of. So for blue, what is my fraction going to be? For blue, what's my fraction? Well, what's the top? What's the numerator? 65, right? There's 65 blue. There are 65 blue. What's my denominator? 270, whatever my total is. Okay, we took how many blue there were and we put it over the total. So type that in your calculator and hit enter. What does it simplify to? 13 over 54. All right, let's do the same thing for red. What's the top for red going to be? 90, right? There's 90 red. What's the numerator or the denominator again? 270, right? This is the number of red out of the total. And then we're just going to put that in the calculator, hit enter. What does that come out to? One third. Let's do the same thing for green. How many green? 115. What's the total? 270. Okay, so that's how many green there are out of the total. When we hit enter, what does that come out to? 23 out of 54. Okay, number 25. 
Car dealership sells 12 red cars out of 180 cars. So they sold 180 cars, 12 of them were red. We want the probability that the next car is going to be red. So we need to find the probability of red. What is that fraction going to look like? 12 out of 180. Okay, when we simplify 12 over 180, comes out to 1 over 15, but look, our answers are in fra uh, percentage. Our answers are in percentage, so we first need to go ahead and convert to a decimal. We need to convert it to a decimal, so we're going to hit that double arrow button, and that's going to come out to 0 0.6, or sorry, 0 0.06666, it keeps on going. Then what do we do? Multiply by 100, and that's going to come out to 6.6 .6 repeated percent. Which number is closest to 6.6 .6 repeated? 6.7, right? A. Answer choice A. Study this tonight. 20 minutes, 30 tops. Study it. You should be fine.